Good morning and welcome to Springwood Church. We're delighted that you've come to join us today. Welcome to the Springwood members, welcome to the Springwood kids. And if you're a visitor joining us, you're very welcome. If you're here for the very first time, you are particularly welcome. My name's Aaron Johnson, I'm the pastor of Springwood Church. And today we'll be studying the third chapter of Joshua in the Old Testament, where we'll see how the Lord performed an, um, an incredible miracle in parting the mighty River Jordan. But before that happened, the people needed to take action to show that they trusted him. Before we turn there, let's, let's look in the Bible, please. I'm going to re read a short passage from 1 Peter towards the very back of the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1 <clears throat> and verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. This passage tells us that, that when all sorts of problems and heartaches come our way, God in his sovereignty and his loving care will use those things to make us more like Jesus as our faith in him is strengthened and ultimately that's a good thing isn't it so what we're going to do now is we're, we're going to say the the creed together it's it's good it's healthy it's important to remind ourselves just to reaffirm of the essentials of the faith we'll say the creed together that'll come up on your screen and then we're going to sing the traditional hymn how firm a foundation the apostles creed I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, oh be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand Upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie My grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee, I only desire Thy droves to consume and thy gold to refine The soul that 
us hath leaned for repose I will not, I will not desert to his foes That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shame I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake That soul, though all hell should persecuted church and it's good to come back to the, the the number one persecuted church which is North Korea North Korea we what do we know about it well the president is Kim Kim Jong-un it has a population of about 25 million its government is a unitary one-party republic its main religion is atheism and its persecution is that Christian Christianity must be eradicated. North Korea is still the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Kim Jong-un demands that he is worshipped as a god, so his poster must be put in every house and every school. If Christians are discovered, they and their families will be killed or imprisoned in, and taken to terrible labour camps, life imprisonment. Police r raids uh, aimed at arresting citizens with deviant thoughts, Christianity, have increased and there continues to be an atmosphere of intense fear throughout the nation. So do we know how many Christians there are in North Korea? Well, it, it's, it's hard to know exactly because they must keep their faith well hidden. But Open Doors estimates it could be up to 400,000. 400,000 out of a population. And yet, 50 to 70,000 could be in these horrendous prisons and labour camps. You know, to be a Christian in North Korea means that you're unable to meet as a church. You're unable to meet other believers. You've got to keep your faith entirely hidden. There are stories of husbands and wives not knowing for many years that their husband and that their spouse was a Christian. Secret police carry out raids to identify Christians and children are encouraged to tell their teachers about any sign of faith that their parents might have at home. A Christian in North Korea is never safe. Is it getting any, is it getting harder to be a Christian in North Korea? <laughs> well, it, it could hardly get any harder, but 2021 is the 20th year in a row that North Korea has been the country where Christians face the most extreme persecution. And of course, COVID-19 has made it even worse. Through the North, though the North Korean authorities claim that the pandemic has had little impact on their country, of course, North Koreans call it the ghost disease because the, the, the people are so man, malnourished, they die very quickly if they catch COVID-19. The, the pandemic has led to tighter security at the Chinese border and it has a stranglehold on the black market, which many people use to survive. Let's pray for North Korea, please. Let's pray. Gracious God, we commit this nation of North Korea into your hands, for you are the Lord of all of heaven and earth. 
Father God, we want to pray for, for Kim Jong-un, that you would speak to his heart, Lord. Holy Spirit, please, would you convict him of his sin? Please, would he allow uh, religious freedom in that land of North Korea? Speak to Kim Jong-un's heart, Lord God, please. Father, we pray that you comfort and strengthen your people that, who are Christians, particularly those who are in prisons and labour camps. Strengthen them, help them, gracious God. And yet, Lord, we praise you that the North Korean church is growing. How amazing, Lord. We bless you for that. Father God, please would you watch over the Christians who are being spied on. Oh, help them to be careful, but help them to gently and safely share their faith with other believers. Lord, please, would you glorify your name in that nation of North Korea, we pray. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Well, let's turn to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, please. And we're up to Joshua chapter 3. We'll be reading 3 and 4, but just 3 for the moment. Joshua chapter 3. God's word says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. As soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp, to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is in full flood during all harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a great heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarephan, where the water flowing down to the, the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, or the, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over Jericho, opposite Jericho, and the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. This is the word of the Lord, and when God's word is read, he speaks. I wonder if you've seen the film Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's the, the third in the trilogy, the original trilogy from the 80s. So in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones is on the search for the Holy Grail. And his father, played by Sean Connery, is drawn into the action. They are not the only ones who are searching for the Holy Grail, though. The film is set in 1938, and the Nazis are after it as well, because they believe it will give them great power to dominate the world. At the climax of the film, they are inside a huge cavern inside a mountain, and to, to force Indiana Jones to go and get the Holy Grail and take risks to get it, the Nazis shoot Indy's father in the stomach. Because they, in, because they know that he'll, he'll take whatever risk is necessary to go and get the Holy Grail because he, they believe its contents will heal his dad of the, this, this gunshot wound. So taking his dad's notebook with him, Indy has to, he goes along this corridor, he has to duck suddenly when a massive steel wheel almost chops him in half and the path leads out onto an, a ledge overlooking this enormous bottomless chasm. He's standing hundreds of feet above a gorge with nothing ahead of him but thin air, it seems. He looks at the notebook 
and it tells them that the Holy Grail is on the opposite side of this gorge and the only way to get it is to step out on thin air. If he does this, a bridge will appear. And so the, the, the camera shoots up to Indy's face. He's shaking and sweating with fear. He takes a very deep breath and he steps forward, seemingly into thin air, and it happens. The bridge appears. He rushes over it, collects the Holy Grail, gives his dad a drink. Dad gets better. They ride off into the sunset and they all live happily ever after. Hooray! We love a happy ending, don't we? The thing is, though, to save his dad's life, he had to take that massive step of faith. And in chapters 3 and 4 of Joshua, we see that God revealing his mighty power. And the thing that we need to learn today is that God does not change. Well, Joshua and his priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They had to take a massive step of faith when they get to the River Jordan. Would they take that step of faith and risk everything? Just just like Indiana Jones did. So we're going to look at this, this passage today under two headings. The first one is, number one, if you want to walk on water, you have to risk getting your feet wet. And number two, look back, and that will help you move forwards. So number one, if you want to walk on water, you have to get your feet wet. Joshua was about to lead the people across the River Jordan into the Promised Land. It was going to be a good land, a land that they did not earn and a land that they did not deserve. But God, who is rich in mercy and grace, would give it freely to them. Now Joshua at this point was feeling quite confident. The two spies that we heard about last week who'd been into the land had given him a favourable report because they, they, they came back. And you can hear the ex excitement in their voices as they reported to the captain last week in, in Joshua 2.24. The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. So Joshua is feeling quite confident. Now, nowadays we know what it is to see a big crowd. I'm sure we've all seen pictures of like, like the Great North Run. And there's always a pic... A picture of the, the, the Great North Runners that they're running across the mighty Tyne Bridge and you can see up to 50,000 people all jogging away there. And it's an amazing spectacle. We know what it is to see big crowds. These Israelites, though, who are about to, to, to cross the Jordan and go into the Promised Land, there was probably two million of them. It's, it's been estimated by some clever people that if they all stood in a line, 25 abreast, do you know how far the line would go back? Possibly 50 miles. The line, 25 abreast, the line would stretch back for 50 miles. So when Joshua went the, through the camp and told the people to get ready to cross, no wonder it took his commanding officers three days to tell everyone the instructions. And so the priests set off with the people keeping the distance behind of about a thousand metres. And the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, this was a box and it had been the, the, the centrepiece of the tabernacle. Inside the box there was the, the actual Ten Commandments written in stone which Moses received from God. And also inside was a jar of manna. That was the food that God had miraculously provided for the people while they were in the desert. And Aaron's rod which had budded. The ark was more than a banner going in, on in front of them. It represented the very presence of God. And because God was going before them, symbolically, they knew he would not let them down. All the tribes that lived in the promised land, you know, the, who is it, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the, the Hivites and the Parasites, all of them, they worshipped idols. But God is going to show that he is the almighty living God. He's going to show those worthless idols what it means to deal with him. So the priests arrived at the water's edge and they looked down. Over the Jordan, there was no bridge. There were no boats. All they had to stand on were the promises of God. 
and they made the conscious decision that the promises of God were enough. Now, if you want to go on with God, there are times when you're going to have to make decisions to stand on the promises of God yourself. It's a choice you will make. Will you choose the safe, comfortable life or will you take a risk and choose to go on and follow God, knowing that God is all you have to rely on? There are, sadly, there are too many Christians today who want to play it safe. But if you want to go on with God, there are times when you need to take risks that seem impossible. But you need to be like these priests and believe that anything is possible for Almighty God. Playing it safe would have kept the children of Israel still living in the desert. Safe. But who wants to live in a desert? You know, the, the, there are times when the River Jordan is just a quiet, gentle, flowing river. That would have been a lovely place to have a, a, a family picnic beside it. We know that's where Jesus got, got baptised and, and at the time it was probably only about chest deep. But not now. If we look at verse 15 it says, Now the Jordan is at f the flood stage during the harvest. So this river was in the flood it had burst its banks. We, we've seen that this week, haven't we? Rivers bursting its banks in the torrential rain we've had. So the Jordan, it, get this, it could have been up to half a mile wide. This was a serious river that God was going to have to deal with to reveal his awesome power. Can, can you imagine the priest standing there praying, God, we, we really need you to part, part these waters. There's no other way across. Either you need to help us, God, or we're going to get swept away. And God stepped in because they stepped into the water. In Joshua 3.16 it says, The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, the salt sea was completely cut off. So it tells us that the, the water stopped at the town of Adam some distance away. It was probably about 20 miles upstream. Now, this was a moving water so that the water upstream piled up in a great heap at the town of Adam, as the, the Bible says, but downstream the water just flowed away into the Dead Sea. Don't, don't have a picture of the Cecily B. DeMille kind of thing with a, a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other and you walk through. No, there was a wall of water 20 miles upstream whilst the, the water flowing down to the Dead Sea, well, it, it, just, it just flowed away. Now, as the priests got to the river, I'm sure they prayed. And there is a time for prayer, but there's a time to stop praying. And there's a time when action is needed. There is a time for prayer, but there's a time to stop praying and action is needed. I'm sure they prayed, but it wasn't until they took action that God answered their prayers. The time for praying was over. It was time literally to step out in faith. And when the feet of the war feet of the priests touched the water, that's when the water parted. Because they showed that they trusted God, then God answered them wonderfully. This is the God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us, as it says in Ephesians 3.20. The priest stepped out into the water and God did amazing things right before their very eyes. But first they had to take the step of faith. It was only when they showed God that they really believed his promises that God acted. They, they really believed God. So my question is, do you? Do you really believe in God? Do you really believe that God is able to do great things today, such as saving the rest of your family, saving this, this great city of Derby? Or in your heart, have you got little confidence so that God is only able to do th those things in the past? Has your God grown weak and old and tired? 
if he has, you, you, you're not worshipping the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the one who loved us enough that he gave his one and only son to die on the cross at Calvary. The God of the Bible is the one who had the power to raise that son to life again. And the God of the Bible does not change. The God who parted the Red Sea for Moses, the God who parted the River Jordan for Joshua, he's the same God who is able to help you. And the same God who can do amazing things in Derby, the same God who can do amazing things in your life. But first, we need to take a risk of getting our feet wet, the way the priests did. You know, not one missionary has ever gone out to the mission field believing that God is small. Every single missionary who's ever served overseas has taken a massive step of faith believing that God is the God of miracles. So if you want to walk on water, you need to risk getting your feet wet and trust that Almighty God will help you. Has the Lord been challenging you about taking a step of faith? Or are you perhaps thinking about getting baptised but, but you're afraid of what your family will say? Or are you wanting to talk to your neighbours about Christ but you're afraid of rejection? Are you considering Bible college but wonder where the money would come from? Are you wondering about starting a new ministry at church once lockdown is started but, but you're, you're lacking the confidence? And folks... Read this book, read this book and see that it's full of stories about an almighty God, the God of the impossible, the God who was with Moses, the God who was with Joshua, and he's still with you exactly the same way because almighty God does not change. Have confidence in this God and get your feet wet. Let's move on to number two, looking forward. Looking back to remember will help you move forwards. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 4, please. Joshua 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the floor of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are, are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over to their camp, where they had put them down. Joshua set up the twelve stones that there had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests had carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are still there to this day. Now the priests who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had, had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, armed in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they revered him all the days of his life just as they had revered Moses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Testimony to, to come up out of the Jordan. 
So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground, when the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran in flood as before. Well, our second point, remember, looking back will help us move forward. So briefly this time, our second point is that Joshua told 12 men, one from each tribe, to collect a big rock from the river bed where the priest stood and then take them to the far side and erect a monument so that they would remember how the Lord had been faithful to his promises. It's, it's good to remember, isn't it? It's good to remember birthdays, anniversaries. It's important to remember Remembrance Day. Tynemouth is a village that's about a mile from our old house up north. And on Tynemouth Front Street is Marshall's Fish and Chip Shop. Marshall's Fish and Chip Shop has one of those blue plaques on the wall outside. And it says, on Friday, March the 10th, 1967, Jimi Hendrix ate fish and chips from this shop on a bench overlooking the sea. So when we are when we go up north and I walk past Marshall's Fish and Chip Shop, I always I look at the sign and I remember the great day when Jimi Hendrix sat and ate fish and chips in my hometown, and that's exactly what the children of Israel would do with this monument. They would look at it and remember. Joshua wanted the monument set up so that when the children asked them, "What are those stones there for?" They would tell the children of the mighty miracle God had performed for his people. It's sadly, it's, it's easy for us to forget God's goodness to, 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 to ourselves. It's easy to forget God's goodness and his faithfulness to us as a church. We, we must always remember why we exist as a church. We are not like a, a, a cruise liner here to make you have a lovely, comfortable time together. No, we, we are, uh, at Springwood Church, we are a lifeboat. We're sent out by God into the rough and the dangerous waters of Derby to rescue as many people as possible for Jesus Christ. A, a lifeboat that comes back empty of rescued people has failed its mission, hasn't it? And so we, are, we will fail our mission only if we forget that we are a lifeboat and we become a cruise liner. That is the day when God has the right to shut us down. The Israelites must never forget what God had done for them when he saved them from the flooded waters of the River Jordan. And we must never forget how God has saved us, if you're a Christian. The price that he paid to save you, if you're a Christian, was to have a crown of thorns thrust upon the head of his own dear son, and to have nails hammered through his hands and his feet, and to be displayed naked before a world that ridiculed him, because that's the only way your sins could be paid for. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. For what I received I passed on to you as of the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. One of our greatest sins must surely be to forget about Calvary, where our precious Saviour died in your place because of your rebellion against God's holy law. Never forget the cross, says Paul. Almighty God, who reigns over all of heaven and earth, he was about to have his people take the land from the Canaanites, the Hittites and the Girgashites. If God could do that through these people, just think what he can do in Derby, if we will but trust him. Remember though, if you want to walk on water, you have to be willing to get your feet wet. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. If you've got any questions about what, be, what we've been saying, or indeed any questions about God and how to be right with him, 
please get in touch. Get in touch through our Facebook page, Springwood Church Derby, or through our website, www.springwoodchurch.org.uk. And if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Well, we're going to sing by uh, closing song now, Faithful One, the God who is faithful to Moses, the God who is faithful to Joshua, the God who is faithful to you and I, the God who is faithful to the Christians in North Korea. Faithful One, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord, I depend on you and I call out to you again and again. Thank you.